In the unfolding drama of a divided Pakistan, the very language people spoke became a battleground. In the east, the air was filled with the rich tone of Bangla, the language of the land. Yet in the west, Urdu reigned, spoken by the powerful and proposed as singular voice of the nation. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the leader who stitched Pakistan from the fabric of freedom, declared Urdu the sole state language. Let me make it very clear to you. Leave no doubt that state language of Pakistan is going to be Urdu and no other language. During his visit to the east in 1948, a decision that sparked protests from the very people he sought to unify, including a passionate voice in the crowd, Mujibur Rahman, who later became the president of the Bangladesh. The Muslim Bengalis there had dreamed of freedom, but the lines drawn by the British had other plans, slicing through the Bengal and setting a countdown to conflict. As the time ticked on, the bond between these two halves of Pakistan grew tense. They were like siblings sharing a name but a, not a room. By 1971, the distance and differences were too great. Language had tied them together. Urdu in the west and Bangla in the east. But words weren't enough to bridge the gap. There is the tale of how a young country, split by land and language, faced its greatest challenge. Before the creation of Pakistan and India in 1947, the Muslim League was founded in Dhaka, and in 1946 elections were declared by Viceroy Lord Wavell. Of the total 1585 seats, Congress won 923 seats, and the All India Muslim League won 425 seats, placing it as the second ranking party. Out of the total 425 seats, the Muslim League's biggest success was in Bengal, where out of the 119 seats of Muslims, it won 113. In Punjab, the consorted effort of the Muslim League led to its greatest success, winning 74 seats of the total Muslim seats and becoming the largest single party in the assembly. Muslim League got overwhelming support in East Bengal. Congress formed government in 1946 election in Muslim-dominated NWFP. Northwest Frontier Province, due to the support of Abdul Ghaffar Khan, whose grandson, Afsan Yar Wali Khan, is a politician in Pakistan. A non Muslim League coalition government was formed in Punjab, as there were total 175 seats, and Muslim League secured 74 seats. The majority win of Muslims in Bengal was instrumental in convincing many Indians about partition. After the partition, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, not an Urdu orator, proclaimed Urdu as a national language in a speech at Dhaka University on March 19, 1948. Muhammad Ali Jinnah's parents were native Gujarati speakers, and the children also came to speak Kuchi, a dialect of Sindhi. However, Muhammad Ali Jinnah was not fluent in Urdu or Gujarati, but was more comfortable with English. Mr. Jinnah wanted to unify the whole nation under one language Urdu, but the decree planted seeds of dissent which blossomed into full-blown riots in 1952 as a language movement. The streets of East Pakistan roared with voices of defiance and blood was spilled as the government, with an Urdu-speaking establishment at its core, attempted to silence the outcry of Bengalis. Out of this movement and the prosecution of Bengalis grew the roots of the Awami League, destined to be the voice of the East. The main thing which provoked Bengalis was the killing of 12 Bengali students where they were protesting against Urdu as a national language. They erected the Shaheed Minar, a monument to the fallen, and marked February 21st as a day of remembrance. Bengalis argued that the single largest Pakistani export is jute, which grows in Bangladesh, and the largest part of budget spending is military. They argued there is no major border issues with India on the East Pakistan side, which is now Bangladesh. So Bengali's wealth was being transferred to West Pakistan instead of them getting their share. In West Pakistan, the number of education and healthcare facilities increased by 160%, whereas in the East Pakistan, it only increased 33%. The per capita income in West Pakistan was 313 while in the East Pakistan, it was around 280. Meanwhile, the Western elite 
uneasy with growing clout of the eastern majority, implemented the one-unit scheme, planning to merge all four provinces in West Pakistan to balance power, which did not work, as Sindh Assembly did not agree to that. There was also the dominance of the West. The chief secretary was a Punjabi, and all the key posts in the East Bengal Secretariat were in the hands of Punjabis or Urdu-speaking civil servants from the outside Bengal. All this was bound to create considerable resentment among local Bengalis. Then came a defining moment in Lahore in 1966. Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, the Iwami League, stepped onto the stage with his six points, demanding real power for his people. List of these six demands, potent and bold, set the stage for an epic struggle. These weren't just points on paper, they were sparks that ignited the Bengali fight for autonomy, a blueprint for revolution that would eventually redraw the map. Six points call for a true federation, one where power wasn't just hoarded in the center, but shared with the West and East Pakistan. Two wings, each with its own currency, or at least rules to keep money from fleeing East to West. They wanted their own bank reserves, their own financial policies, essentially the tools to craft their own economic destiny. Defense and foreign relations were to be left with central government. Taxes and revenues would be the East and West's own affair, with the center only dipping into shared pot. And when it comes to the riches earned from overseas, it demanded separate coffers, fair sharing and the freedom to trade globally within chain. Lastly, East Pakistan sought its own shield and sword, a separate militia to stand guard over its dreams. The opposition branded Mujibur Rahman a separatist, a rebel, turning him into a target. And just like that, the leader with the vision for the East found himself in the crosshair of power, a marked man on the brink of birthing a nation. Mujib found himself in the center of a storm, tangled in the web of the Agatla conspiracy, accused alongside 35 others of plotting with the Indian agent. The charge was nothing less than a treason. It was a scheme set to be so deep that even the walls of his cell couldn't contain his influence. In 1968, Mujib was arrested and taken to court. Their quiet talk became loud protests. The trial, instead of stopping the fight for freedom, made it stronger. When the government tried to make Mujibur Rahman look bad by taking about his six points plan, it actually helped show how East Pakistan needed to be treated equally. Every time they tried to make Mujibur Rahman look a bad guy, he became more of a hero. He wasn't just a man being judged in court, he turned into a symbol of what people wanted, justice and fairness. In Pakistan, money matters. East Pakistan thought it wasn't getting a fair share. Even when there were plans to make things equal, East Pakistan's money expert told their leaders that their things were still unfair. They said that the West Pakistan was getting more attention. Big projects like the huge Indus Basin project and the new capital city in Islamabad were happening in West Pakistan. And they didn't even count these in normal way of sharing money. Business people in West Pakistan found it easier to get the special permissions they needed to start big companies. There were hardly any big companies owned by Bengali people from East Pakistan. That's why businesses in West Pakistan were doing really well, but in East Pakistan, the market was quiet, showing they were missing out on good chances. It wasn't just about business either. With the lion's share of the military parked in the West, the money spent on soldiers, salaries and building bases didn't factor into the financial equation. It was as if the East's contribution to the nation defense was invisible. Sartaj Aziz, another economic sage, argued in his writing that the East could thrive on its own, less burdened by defense costs. They could feed themselves with American aid and still have cash to spare for growth. Unlike the West, which seems to be drowning in debts and defense duties, the government's conspiracy case against Mujibur Rahman crumbled and with it the image of an unshakable regime. As the nation of Pakistan simmered with unrest, a Yub Khan's grip on power was slipping. The streets echoed with the voice of dissent, demanding fairness and freedom. In a twist, 
no one saw coming. Ayub handed the reign not to the rightful successor, but to his army chief general Yahya Khan, stirring a fresh wave of uproar. Yahya Khan, stepping into a nation on the edge, promised change. He vowed elections, scrapping the one-unit policy, hoping to soothe the fiery spirits of the Bengalis. Yet despite his promises, he was a man distracted, juggling international diplomacy and reports of his own shaky leadership. The people were promised a voice in the elections, but Mother Nature had her own devastating agenda. The deadly cyclone Bola swept in leaving a trial of destruction exposing the government's sluggish and weak response. The calamity's whispers of neglect turned into roars of outrage as Yahya Khan, appearing disheld and distant, failed to grasp the gravity of the disaster. In the midst of the chaos, voices of defiance rose. Sheikh Mujib Rahman and Mulana Bashani, both champions of the people, called out the government's faltering steps, their call for regional autonomy became a rally cry for a better, more responsive leadership. When election time came, it was a historic moment, broadcasted live to a nation hungry for transparency. Mujib, strategic in his political chess game, fielded candidates, mainly in the East. Eyeing a sweeping victory, Bhutto's stronghold remained in the West but neither could deny the other's influence. The election results sent shockwaves. The Awami League's landslide in the East was a clear mandate, while Bhutto's succession in the West set the stage for a power tussle. Yahya Khan hinted at Mujibur Rahman's rise to leadership. The political dance was far from over. Bhutto did not want to give power to Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, whose Awami League had won the 1970 general elections and became the leader of the opposition. General Yahya Khan feared that if the power of a united Pakistan was handed over to Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, the army headquarters would be shifted to Dhaka. The institution's control in West Pakistan will end. Bhutto's insistence and Yahya Khan's maneuvering led to high stakes meeting between the rivals. It was in the electrified atmosphere for the nation watching that the seeds of a new future were sowed. As the tension in the East Pakistan simmered, a shadowy plot by the army to control the unrest came to the light. The architect of this plan, Lieutenant General Sahib Zada Yaqub Khan, had a change of heart and backed away from using force. His hesitation cost him his position. In his place stepped Lieutenant General Tikha Khan, known for his iron fist, ready to clamp down on any dissident. Like most senior army officers, even at general headquarters, Lieutenant General Tikha Khan was ill-informed about the situation in East Pakistan. He had never served in East Pakistan. At best, his knowledge of the province was superficial and was based on the odd visits at the Quartermaster General while at General Headquarters. He did not realize that this time he had been given an impossible mission. He had no political mandate, whereas the problem was inherently political and would not lend itself to a military solution. Numerous opportunities presented themselves to the authorities, but the bias remained in favor of flying false. Negotiation turned off with Yahya Khan's team on one side of the table and the Awami League's finest minds on the other. Yet they noticed a glaring gap. No actual plan of new constitution was in sight from the military chiefs. Even when discussions with Bhutto's representative unfolded, the same void echoed back at them. A final economic talk, meant to bridge divides, ended without the promise. Order came down from Yahya Khan's team to leave for the West leaving hope for a united resolution unfilled and the future of a nation hanging in the balance. As the dark night of March 25, 1971 enveloped East Pakistan, Operation Searchlight came to the light. Lieutenant General Niazi was the man chosen to share this mission, aimed to quelling the rise tide of dissident, quite of the night was shattered as the military moved with a purpose that was as grim as it was determined. Mujibur Rahman was arrested from his house and sent to West Pakistan. The army, calling those who disagreed with them black sheeps, 
started using a lot of violence against the East Bengali Regiment and the people living there. The mission started to maintain Pakistani governance over the self-determination driven Bangladeshi. The operation intended to capture activists, intellectuals and troopers. However, they were not the only victims. The humanitarian crisis broke loose as millions of civilians endured the violent realities of displacement, financial instability, trauma and death. The Mukti Bani began as a conventional force for volunteers from the East Bengal Regiment, an infantry regiment and East Pakistan Rifles, a border constabulary not known as Border Guard Bangladesh, who revolted against Islamabad's army. Officers who defected including Colonel M.A.G. Usmani, who commanded Mukti Bani forces in Bangladesh, and Major Ziaur Rahman, who later served as the president of Bangladesh. Stories about how the Mukti Bani fought back and how the army harshly punished them really caught the attention of people watching from the other countries. Like Archer Blood, he was in Dhaka and sent messages back to Washington. In these messages, he described the terrible things happening and how no one was doing anything to stop it. This made it seem like the world wasn't doing the right thing by not helping. Between August and November 1971, Amidst the Bangladesh Liberation War, frogmen of the Bengali Mukti Bani freedom fighters sank more than 100,000 tons of merchant shipping and damaged another 50,000 tons in their struggle for the independence against the military regime of West Pakistan. These attacks left international shipping in what was then East Pakistan defenseless and practically uninsurable. They knocked out power plants, destroyed bridges, severed the military sea lines of communication and brought production and export of its major crop, tea and jute, to a near standstill. These Mukti Bani soldiers were trained and equipped with a covert action program by Indian intelligence. The full scale of the horror, especially the systematic violations against Bengali women, defied comprehension and evaded acknowledgement from Pakistani authorities. Pakistani army's violence against the Bengali people is undeniable. However, I plan to create a separate video to discuss the controversy surrounding the accuracy of the casualty figures of 3 million deaths and rape cases of 400,000 in 9 months by the Bengali side and whether these figures are accurate or exaggerated. Despite the ongoing dispute, it's evident that some members of the Pakistani military engaged in reprehensible and unforgivable acts. As a Pakistani, I feel deep shame about this. Every life holds immense value. The sexual assault of even one woman, be it one or a thousand or million, is equally abhorrent and unacceptable. In the West Pakistan, a veil of silence and censorship kept the truth from the public eye, while across the border, the swell of refugees into the India marked the beginning of a seismic shift. Indira Gandhi, seizing the moment, readied her forces for a decisive move that would reshape the subcontinent's destiny. As the year unfolded, the reality of the horrors in East Pakistan began to pierce the international community's awareness. Mujib's journey from Agartla to the halls of global power became a mission to shine a light on the Bengali flight, seeking solidarity for a people in their darkest hour. As the chapters of conflict turned their final pages in 1971, a new actor stepped onto the subcontinent stage. As I mentioned, Indira Gandhi of India, her forces melded with the Mukti Bani, training them to challenge Pakistanis stressed and under-equipped troops in the east. With no air or naval might to speak of, the Pakistani soldiers were left to stand against a swelling tide. General Niazi's plan was a simple one. Guard the borders and keep India at bay. But with every passing day, his isolated men, lacking support from the skies, fought against overwhelming odds. As the year waned, General Yahya Khan gambled the fate of his nation on a desperate bid for global attention, launching an attack on Indian airfields. It was a move born of last resort, and it spiraled into a full-scale war. The dice were cast, but fortune did not favor him. 
His allies abroad remained silent spectators as Indian prayer troopers descended on an unguarded Dhaka. The echoes of surrender came on December 16th as General Niazi, his pride cloaked in defeat, ordered a token of surrender to his Indian counterpart. Meanwhile, Mujib, the heart of the Bengalis' resistance, awaited his fate far from the battlefield. Following his release, he first traveled to London, where he briefly stayed, and then flew to New Delhi, India, where he was warmly received by Indian leaders, acknowledging his pivotal role in the newly independent Bangladesh. Finally, Najibur Rahman made a historic journey to Dhaka, arriving in a free Bangladesh to a hero's welcome. The dream of a united Pakistan crumbled as Bangladesh rose from the ashes of conflict, declaring its own place in the world. In the aftermath, General Yahya found himself ousted, and Bhutto, once a voice on the international stage, stepped into the leadership role through the shadowed path of martial law. In the aftermath of the 1971, approximately 93,000 Pakistani soldiers, including military and civilian personnel, surrendered to the Indian forces and the Mukti Bani in Dhaka on December 16, 1971. This event marking one of the largest surrenders since World War II. Post-surrender, these prisoners of wars were detained in various camps across India. Their status became a central point in the complex diplomatic negotiations that followed, involving India, Pakistan, and the state of Bangladesh. The resolution of their situation and eventual release was a significant aspect of their Shimla agreement signed between India and Pakistan. This agreement laid the groundwork for the return of the prisoners of war back to Pakistan marking a crucial step in the normalization of relations between the involved nation post-conflict. Bhutto's moment of triumph was short-lived as later the very military he commanded turned against him, marking yet another turn in Pakistan's tumultuous journey, which we will discuss in another video. In the silence of archives lay a buried report, a testament to the missteps and miscalculations that led to a nation's division. The East, now Bangladesh, emerged not just a new country, but as a testament to the enduring spirit of its people who had longed for recognition and respect. Pakistan was forever altered, navigating through coups and new dawns. And in the East, sentiment was clear. Though birthed through pain, the emergence of Bangladesh was a triumph for its people. Thank you very much for watching my video. If you like my content, don't forget to subscribe. Thank you.